is Ursula Sims Williams, one of the curators of the exhibition Alexander the Great, The Making of a Myth. For those of you who haven't yet seen the exhibition, Alexander the Great, The Making of a Myth is the first exhibition to focus on the rich history of storytelling of one of the most colorful figures of the ancient world. From astrological clay tablets, ancient papyri and medieval manuscripts, through to films and video games, the exhibition reveals how Alexander's character has been adapted and appropriated across different cultures and religions over 2,000 years. Featuring over 130 exhibits from 25 countries in 21 different languages, it highlights Alexander's universal appeal and explores how his legacy turned into legend, a transformation that started in his lifetime and continues today. So tonight, it's my great pleasure on behalf of the British Library to welcome you to this, the first of our exhibition-related events, which is presented in memory of the author and scholar Nasib Shaheen. We're fortunate to have as our host this evening the author and broadcaster Tom Holland, whose books include Rubicon, The Triumph and Tragedy of the Roman Republic, and especially relevant tonight, Persian Fire, his award-winning history of the Greco-Persian Wars. He'll be hosting tonight's guests, Lindsay Allen, lecturer in Greek and Near Eastern history at King's College London. She's the author of The Persian Empire and specializes in the history of pre-Islamic Iran, Persepolis, Alexander, and the Near East in the first millennium BC. Our second guest is leading expert Richard Stoneman, honorary visitor professing at the University of Exeter. His works include the translation of the Greek Alexander Romance, Alexander the Great, A Life in Legend, A History of Alexander in World Culture, and most recently, the book of the exhibition, Alexander the Great, The Making of a Myth, which is on sale at the British Library Bookshop. So with that, it's my great pleasure now to hand you over to Tom Holland to introduce tonight's event. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you, uh, everyone, for coming. Um, I think when one is doing an event at the British Library, really the done thing is to begin with a little bit of Shakespeare. So um, I'm going to open with possibly the most famous scene in Shakespeare's most famous play, uh, Hamlet. Um, he is hanging out with Horatio in the graveyard. Um, he's about to dig up the skull of Yorick. Um, and Hamlet muses and reflects on uh, the vanity of human greatness. And his mind turns, inevitably, I guess, to the greatest man who ever lived. Alexander died, Alexander was buried, Alexander returneth to dust. The dust is earth, of earth we make loam. And why of that loam where to he was, he was commented, might they not stop a beer barrel? So Alexander turned to dust might become a stopper for a barrel of beer. And Hamlet, in saying that, of course, is emphasizing the way that even someone as great as Alexander, in the end, we're all dead. But of course, by choosing Alexander, Hamlet is also bigging him up. Alexander is chosen because his fame is on such an epic scale. And to this day, Alexander is probably one of the most famous people who ever lived. And his story continues to fascinate and to thrill because it is one of the great, great epics of history. So I'll just give a very, very brief sketch of his life. I'm sure all of you will be familiar with it, but just in case there are some who aren't. Um, he was born in 356 BC. He was uh, a prince in Macedon, um, the land 
that lay to the north of Greece. There was debate among the Greeks as to whether the Macedonians actually counted as Greek. Alexander thought he was. His enemies in Greece often begged to differ. His parents, well, there was um, Olympias, uh, a princess from the, the land of Epirus near what's basically Albania now. Uh, back then, it was a land celebrated for its witches and the, uh, the bloodthirsty savagery of its domestic politics. And Alexander's father was the king of Macedon, Philip. Or was he? And that is a theme that I suspect we will come to over the course of this evening. Philip was um, a very great conqueror in his own right. He had basically uh, put the whole of Greece with its quarreling uh, city-states in his shadow. And Alexander was raised, taught by Aristotle, the greatest philosopher of his day, trained in war. He um, made his own uh, a ferocious war horse that no one else had been able to tame by the name of Bucephalus. At the age of 18, he commanded the cavalry in Philip's great victory over the armies of Thebes and Athens, the two most military potent city-states of their day in Greece, um, and which effectively ended Greek independence for good. Um, Alexander and Philip had a, a spectacular bust-up. When Philip died, murdered, there were accusations that perhaps Alexander and almost certainly Olympias was involved. So, uh, no, a, a complicated family life, I think it's fair to say. Now, someone else who perhaps may have lain behind the assassination of Philip was the great king, the king of kings, the king of Persia, who ruled as the most powerful man on the planet. Um, the Persians ruled an empire that stretched from the Aegean all the way to India, and its wealth and its manpower were celebrated. Back in the fifth century, the Persians had tried to conquer Greece. And Philip, in raising an army and aspiring to uh, invade the Persian Empire, was consciously setting out, he, he proclaimed, to, to gain revenge for, for what the Persians had done when they had invaded Greece. With Philip's death, the young Alexander takes over. And he crosses um, into Asia. He wins a great battle at the river of Granicus. He uh, subdues the whole of Asia Minor. He meets with the great king himself in a battle at Isis on the kind of the hinge between what's now Turkey and Syria. And he takes prisoner the great king's uh, mother and several of his wives. He then goes southwards. He, um, uh, he, 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 he captures the Phoenician city of Tyre after a, a great and murderous siege. He conquers Egypt. Uh, he goes deep into the desert to an oracle called Siwa, where he is hailed not as the son of Philip, but as the son of Ammon, who, uh, the king of the Egyptian gods, who is equated with Zeus by the Greeks. Uh, and so that gives Alexander, who is, not, who is never knowingly modest, a great deal to think about. Um, he then founds um, the most famous of a large number of cities that with, as I say, he's a very modest man, uh, he names all these cities that he founds after himself, but the most famous Alexandria, of course, is the Alexandria that he founds in Egypt. He then heads eastwards, he meets the great king for a second time in a mighty battle on the plains of northern Mesopotamia. The great king flees, his armies are defeated, the wealth and the glory of Mesopotamia, Babylon, and then Persia in the form of Persepolis, the great um, city built by Darius the Great, um, the king who had sent the army to Marathon. It falls into his hands. Just as uh, Darius's son Xerxes had burnt Athens, so now Alexander burns Persepolis. He sets off in pursuit of uh, the fugitive great king. The great king has been murdered. Alexander is accepted by most Persians as their monarch. He heads onwards and onwards, up into what is now Afghanistan, down into what is now the Punjab, comes back through a murderously hot desert um, uh, that kills large numbers of his men. Why he does it, maybe we'll touch on that. Legend is that he does it because the desert is there and people say it can't be done, so Alexander does it. Uh, he returns to Babylon and there, at a very young age, he dies. Um, 
age 32. And from that moment on, he graduates into legend. There are people, of course, who worship him literally as a god. His body is removed by one of his generals, um, Ptolemy, to Alexandria, the city in Egypt that he had founded, uh, and he, his, his, his coffin is laid out there and preserved goodness knows how long. Uh, equally, there are many who hate him. The news of his death brought to Athens is greeted by one orator with scorn. Alexander dead, how can he be dead? The stench of his corpse would fill the earth. And from that point on, both Alexander's admirers and his detractors have told and retold and retold his story. Now, it is a puzzle, however. It's a curious aspect of this famous, famous story that Alexander, although he is one of history's supreme celebrities, in fact, the sources for his life the continuous histories, the continuous biographies, are actually very late. They all date from the Roman period. And there's a very real sense in which the Alexander that we tend to have in our mind's eye is less a Macedonian figure, perhaps, than a Roman one. And this, in turn, I think, the, the, there are two corollaries which, of this which we want to explore tonight with our two wonderful speakers. The first is that if we want to get back to the pre-Roman Alexander, if we want to get back to some sense of how his contemporaries, not just in the Greek world, but in the Persian world that he conquered, if we want to get some sense of, of, of how he was seen, of what Alexander, the historical Alexander, may actually have been, it's kind of like panning for gold. You need incredible expertise, incredible um, scholarship, and that's why it's so brilliant that we have Lindsay Allen here, who is one of the great world experts on this subject. Great, great um, figure trying to work out what can, how, how, how easily can we place Alexander, not in the context of um, the stories told about him by Romans, but in the context of the age in which he actually lived. But there's also a further corollary to the fact that. Um, the stories that are told about Alexander are very late. And that is that um, a figure so legendary, about whom, whom so many stories are told, it is very, very easy for these stories over the course of the centuries and of the millennia to become, well, ever more improbable, ever more implausible, to start featuring griffins and submarines and dragons, as we saw up on the screen. And these stories have perpetuated the fame of Alexander through time and across the globe. Um, and there is no one better to take us through this process than Richard Stoneman, whose brilliant, brilliant book on, um, on Alexander, A Life in Legend, reveals just how many peoples and how many different ages have told fantastical stories about Alexander, from Iceland to China. Um, and so that, too, is a part of the history of Alexander. We have Lindsay to try and give us some sense of who the real Alexander was, and we then have Richard to absolutely obscure that and go on about dragons. So, um, Dragons, right. Lindsay, I think you should go first. <laughs> so, we, so, we, so we're absolutely attuned to all the inaccuracies that Richard is then going to detail for us. So. Yeah, I have bad news for you, Tom. Um, I think I'm going to be also talking about uh, mutations of Alexander, the difficulty of reaching him. Um, can I have the, my slide starting? Thank you. Beautiful um, blended appearance there. Um, as Tom mentioned, I work on the Achaemenid Persian Empire, the empire that Alexander conquers and in the process rather rips apart. Um, and uh, it's often easy to forget that uh, the, really most of his um, 
empire in Asia Minor, um, in Western Asia as a whole, Mesopotamia going on into Central Asia, is all part of the same uh, political entity um, for over 200 years before his invasion. So one of the things that influences our historical sources is um, the, the influence, the weight, um, the afterlife of the political shape of this empire. And if you think about the, the fact that this is the stage that Alexander is entering onto, the stage settings of that empire, of that dynasty, somewhat influence how he moves and, and also really the script that is written for him by others. So the kinds of sources that even might have been generated um, in his lifetime are likely to be influenced by um, uh, the stories of the Achaemenids, the previous monarchs. Um, this image I'm showing you is from the 18th century, and it's showing you Alexander visiting the tomb of Cyrus. It's a fanciful realization of the tomb of Cyrus. Um, but it illustrates very neatly the preoccupation that emerges in our Roman sources that Alexander has for um, his predecessors. Um, in some cases, some of his acts of competition, such as going across the desert, uh, are mentioned as, as part of a competition with the memory of Cyrus, who is the founder of the Persian Empire that Alexander is in the process of conquering. The focus in our narratives um, on Alexander's relationship with the memory of Cyrus um, rather does down the memory of later kings like Darius and our later Xerxes, Artaxerxes, and so on. So really, Alexander is placed in this kind of personal relationship with the founder of the empire so that Alexander can found it anew. Um, and part of what I am saying today is really based on the way I've tried to teach Alexander the Great. Tom was extremely flattering about my position um, in this discipline. Um, I, my main work, really, on Alexander in recent years has been attempting to teach it to successive generations of students, along with my colleagues in King's College London. And part of that struggle has been to introduce the framework of the preceding political environment. And here you're seeing the actual tomb of Cyrus at Pasargadai in Fars in Iran. Um, and think about um, how our sources are commentating or receiving the memory of that empire as well as Alexander at the same time. And not only that, my other message to the students, and this is where they get, start to get very frustrated, um, and apologies to any of them who are listening tonight, um, is to say that really Alexander's brief life is, is, is squished, is, is kind of concentrated and reformed between the weight of the Persian Empire and then um, the weight of his successors. So in a sense, he is the thing on the anvil being, the anvil being the Persian Empire, being hit by hammers that are the successors, pressuring his, the shape of his life and our sources into new perspectives. So this is one example of that. Um, on the left, you have um, a large orthostat relief, that is a sort of big uh, relief that goes up quite high above your head. Um, that used to uh, stand in the center of the audience hall at Persepolis, that is Parsa, the capital of the Persian Empire that Alexander um, burned. Um, this image shows the Persian king in audience, and you can see he is being approached by a petitioner. This is something found at the capital, but it is also circulated around the empire in select examples that we have, um, reaching as far as the western coast of Asia Minor, and even commented upon in Greek style by artists working in um, the Greek mainland and beyond in southern Italy. So this scene of the Persian king in audience, which is, itself is based on older vis visions of kingship in this area, is something that is circulating by the time Alexander steps into um, that context. Now, you may have become aware of the fact that Alexander is um, reputed to have taken on some aspects of the kingship there. But in this narrative in Quintus Curtius Rufus, one of our Roman sources, he is represented as misunderstanding the elements of the audience scene. We've got a footstool that is instead a table. Um, so he's sitting on the royal throne. It was a little bit too high for him, and therefore he has a stool, a table um, as a footstool. Um, and this is uh, provoking distress, according to this tale, uh, amongst his attendants. 
Um, and the distress um, he re responds to in a sort of conscientious way, according to this tale. Um, and then his companion, Philotas, says, no, no, this is an omen of how you are taking over the Persian Empire. Um, now, in our Roman source, this is um, placed at Susa, one of the other Persian capitals. Um, and um, it is before his rival, Darius III, is actually dead. So this is in the process of... Um, of conquest. Um, I want to point out that really almost everybody, I think, at the, in the fourth century associated with this court would have known what this image was and what it meant, that it's a kind of political image. Um, so what's happened with this story is that it has mutated and turned into a little parable or a little kind of prophetic fable um, about um, the takeover of um, the Persian Empire by Alexander. And this is just one example of how where we have quite what seem quite to be quite informal or intimate glimpses into the life of Alexander as he conquers the empire, we actually have something that is quite political, quite inflected, quite mutated in its, in its transmission. Uh, and by the way, just to, to support my point to say that this is um, known about um, in the fourth century at the point when Alexander is invading, you have an outline here on the right of the same scene painted on the interior of a shield um, on the so-called Alexander sarcophagus excavated from Sidon, which was created for um, a king ruling in Sidon who was in fact appointed by Alexander. And thus it portrayed uh, as part of its decorative program the takeover, the defeat of Persians by Alexander and his forces. And part of the symbolism of that defeat is a useless shield being, being thrown up in the air, um, not defending its Persian carrier with the audience scene inside. This is an image, uh, an object that you can see in the um, exhibition, and it's just something I wanted to quote here um, to show you how memory does form for the immediate um, course of the invasion by Alexander. In this case, it is um, a scribal record of events during, before, during, and after the Battle of Galgamila, which is really the big cataclysmic battle that removes some of the great barriers, the massed armies of the Persian <laughs> king, uh, to Alexander's advance into Iran. Um, in this case, it is really about recording data in order to support the sort of scientific program of scholars in Babylon. So the barest minimum of information is often recorded. It could have been recorded almost immediately, and it could have, or it could have been recorded rather a little bit after the event as a sort of edited compilation. In this case, in the fragmentary translation, not mine, <laughs> I hasten to add, um, you, you have um, a record of a series of proclamations or communications between the advancing invader and the authorities in the city of Babylon. Um, and in this case, we have um, the kinds of assurances that a conqueror might have issued to the, uh, the city that feared his progress, feared his coming, um, as he advanced. And in this case, the city worked to, in negotiating with him, in receiving these proclamations, in allowing him into the city, worked to preserve the city from the kinds of vengeance that other centers suffered from Alexander for resisting his, um, resisting his invasion. Um, and what I want to point out is that this is actually not dissimilar from the kind of negotiation Cyrus um, the Great, Cyrus the founder of the Persian Empire, would have gone through back in the 6th century BCE. And indeed, in that case, um, excavated in Babylon, there was a, a, a sort of an ideological document, uh, a foundation cylinder in Cyrus's name, recording how he too was welcomed into the city by the, by the people of Babylon and did all the correct things uh, for the cult of Marduk, the, the god of Babylon. So what you have here is a framework in an, an age-old city like Babylon which accommodates um, the conqueror. Um, now, this is all very well when we know that Alexander conquered Babylon. What becomes rather more difficult is when we have our traditions growing, um, including uh, places where we suppose he did not go. I'm showing you an image here of a reconstructed uh, illustration of um, Alexander advancing on Jerusalem. Now, this just appears in one author, Josephus, and it's normally not incorporated in our understanding um, of how Alexander went about his um, invasion because he 
had far more important places uh, for that period to go to, um, uh, to invade, such as Tyre, Sidon, and Gaza, which are mentioned on his way to Egypt. Um, but the description of Josephus is extremely elaborate and involves him sending proclamations forward um, and the priests in Jerusalem becoming aware of his impending arrival and then the welcoming committee that goes out to um, invite him in and accompany him in and also his introduction to the cult of the city um, and also um, his introduction to the prophecies of the city um, which, which sort of foretell that he will take it over. Um, so in this case, we have an incredibly elaborate and lively record of the takeover of city that most historians don't think quite happened. And this is, I think, a really great illustration of how story and memory can form around a character like Alexander quite quickly, and it can be almost indistinguishable from the real thing. So it's not necessarily griffins and dragons which distinguish what is real from what is not. Uh, and just by way, I'm going to crowbar in my favorite place as part of this talk by way of a last example. Um, this on the left, you're seeing uh, part of the, um, and this is possibly for Richard and for Tom, the um, gateway of Xerxes, the side of the gateway of Xerxes at Persepolis, um, which um, Alexander destroyed. In the middle, you're seeing a, an image which sadly isn't in the show because it's just been recently <laughs> on show in Dublin. It's a 17th century Shahnameh, um, and the epic of the Persian kings, written in Persian um, uh, from the uh, 11th century, um, and this copy being from the 17th century, painted in 1655. In this, you see Alexander in his marriage celebration with his new wife, Roxana, who in this story is part of the Persian royal family. You find Alexander being integrated into Persian epic, into Persian literature very thoroughly, and that's something you can go and see in re uh, illustrated really well um, in the exhibition. But the other thing to note is that uh, all that this really illustrates is how much Alexander's memory continued to be connected to this site in Persian language traditions as well as thinking about our Roman um, receptions of Alexander. And one thing I want to leave you with is the possibility that there were multiple receptions of Alexander on the ground immediately, which aren't caught in our Roman filter, but which contributed to the richness of the tradition that you see in, illustrated in the exhibition. Um, and I, all I wanted to point out here is my favorite thing about this um, illustration, and that is the artist Muin Musavir's attempt to show that this is indeed happening at Persepolis, or Istacha as it's called in his text, um, with, uh, as I've put the little um, rectangle around it, a little stone figure that is representing our reliefs visible at Persepolis in the 17th century. Um, I'm going to jump over this because I don't want to go on to, to, for too long, but I want to point out that in fact that local memory of the site um, is, is worthwhile because the site continued to be used after Alexander's destruction, and indeed one of the fragments that you may go and look at in the British Museum comes from a facade that was moved around late in the fourth century, presumably as part of trying to use this site as part of the local governmental structure after its um, sort of first cataclysmic encounter with Alexander. So I'll end there, and I just want to also um, kind of pay tribute to really um, the many scholars who've contributed to my view of Alexander, uh, Pierre Briand, Amélie Kurt, and others, um, and with whom we talk about not just Alexander, but his conquered nations, as it were, um, and the ghosts, really, of the empire that, that was taken apart by his invasion. Um, and I should also, I guess, point out that over the many, now over 15 years of teaching Alexander to undergraduates, um, I've noticed that um, the reception of him by them has changed gradually over that time. People's attitudes to conquest has changed. <coughs> People's attitudes to kingship and monarchy um, have changed. And also to the multiple perspectives on Alexander that we can recover. So I'll hand over and to uh, Richard and Tom to talk more about those. Thank you. I've been living with Alexander now for more than half my life. 
or I should say I've been living with the legends of Alexander uh, in the form of the, the Alexander romance. Um, I first came across this work when I was in the 1980s, when I was, <coughs> when I was researching a book, an anthology of travel writing about Greece, and I came across quite a number of curious stories about Alexander and his exploits in Greece, none of which I'd encountered in any of my undergraduate reading when I had studied Alexander. For example, there was the story of, uh, the, um, which conveyed that Alexander was actually not the son of Philip and Olympias, as the historians tell you, but the son of the exiled pharaoh Nectanebo, who had uh, taken refuge in Pella, rather fallen for Olympias, and contrived to make her pregnant by disguising himself as a dragon. Um, and that is a story that I encountered in uh, both in medieval Greek sources and in medieval English texts. Uh, dragons, serpents came up again in a Cretan story, which I put into my book. And as these curious stories began to uh, accumulate, I thought, uh, There's, th this is something I'd like to know more about. There's a book in this, and I, I, uh, if I want to know about something, I write a book about it. Um, so I went into it, and I discovered that the ultimate source of all these stories was the Alexander Romance, the Greek Alexander Romance, which had never been uh, uh, mentioned to me when I was an undergraduate. Um, my researches into the Alexander Romance then kept me busy for the next 20 years until I produced the, the book which uh, Tom kindly mentioned, Alexander the Great to Life in Legend. But I started by making a translation for Penguin of the, Alex of the Greek Alexander Romance. <clears throat> now, that in itself was not a particularly easy thing to do, because there are actually five Greek Alexander Romances. Um, these, are, these are called recensions. The first, uh, the first um, was, certainly, was written in antiquity, there are scholars who believe that it was written in about the third century AD. There are others like me who think it was probably put together in the third century BC, by and large, in its uh, existing form. Um, that particular version survives in one manuscript in Paris, um, and it's a very corrupt text. Some of it doesn't make sense. Um, it was then copied, but more than copied, rewritten several times throughout antiquity, and each person who decided to rewrite it changed the language, uh, changed the grammar, left out bits they couldn't understand, tried to make sense of bits that were puzzling, added new stories, um, and uh, the, the, as a result, there are, five, as I say, five different recensions of the uh, of the Alexander Romance. When I uh, did The Penguin, I had to choose a particular copy text, and I chose a manuscript called L, which is uh, so-called because it resides in the university in uh, library in Leiden, in the Netherlands. And it's the only version which contains the two wonderful stories about the, the diving bell and the flying machine. Um, which have become absolutely iconic for the Alexander legends. My researches into uh, these texts led me into all kinds of topics, into the relation of this text to other ancient Greek novels. Um, it's, uh, you might, if you believe like I do, that it was written in a couple of generations after Alexander, then it's the first historical novel. Um, it uh, involved investigations into ethnography because Alexander encounters monsters and monstrous peoples in the course of his uh, <clears throat> in the course of his expedition to the east, and it involved philosophy because of the uh, the central scene where he encounters the naked philosophers of Taxila in the, in uh, in northern uh, Pakistan. 
um, and enters into debate with them. But the five, the five Greek recensions were only the beginning of the story. The, uh, there were two Latin versions made before the, uh, by the end of antiquity. And as the centuries went on, the Alexander Romance was translated into every language of medieval Europe. It was, it's, uh, it was translated into Persian, into Arabic, into Syriac, and many of the other languages of the, uh, the Middle and Far East, um, including a Malay version, which is based on one of the Arabic versions. Um, nobody can possibly control traditions in all these languages. Uh, I have a few languages, and I learned a bit of Persian, but in 2010, I organized a conference at the University of Exeter, in which, on, which was called Alexa the Alexander Romance in Persia and the East, which brought together a great many scholars who could speak authoritatively about um, many of these uh, um, more exotic uh, versions of the Alexander legends, including Turkic, Mongolian, Chinese, and so on. And uh, as, the, uh, as the years have gone by, the number of scholars working in this field, I'm pleased to say, has mushroomed. So almost, uh, almost every, um, every language tradition is now getting its uh, requisite attention. Um, in, the, in the Middle Ages, the Alexander Romance, as I said, was translated or refashioned in every language of Europe, uh, as Tom said, from Iceland and Ireland um, to, uh, um, to Serbia, uh, Bulgaria, Russia. Um, and um, was, there are, in fact, more versions of the, I believe, more versions of the Alexander Romance extant than of any other work except the Gospels. In fact, Alexander even made it into the Bible um, because um, people in the Middle Ages noticed that there's a gap between the end of the uh, Old Testament and the beginning of the Book of Maccabees. And in producing the beautiful illustrated history Bibles, they decided that it would be a good idea to insert the Alexander Romance as a bridge. So uh, Alexander just carries you neatly from the end of the Old Testament to, uh, to the beginning of the Hellenistic period. <coughs> uh, and it should not be forgotten that he also appears in the Quran. In Surah 18 of the Quran, the search for the water of life is uh, told. Um, in, in, this, uh, in this version, he is known as Dul Qarnain, uh, the two-horned one. So what does it all mean? Well, how, why, does this, uh, why does this particular story about Alexander achieve such, an, achieve such traction, make such an impact um, when the, the more sober, authoritative historians like Arian and Quintus Curtius really don't get that much attention during the, the Middle Ages? They begin to come into their own again in the Renaissance. Well, I think it all goes back to this uh, moment when Alexander encounters the naked philosophers at Taxila. Um, he asks them a series of silly questions, uh, like who are more numerous, the living or the dead? Um, and uh, what, is, uh, what is the nature of kingship? Um, um, at the end of the, when they've given their answers, they ask him for immortality, but he says, I can't give you immortality because I'm only a mortal myself. Um, and they say, well, if you're only a mortal, then why do you career around the world killing everybody? Uh, uh, to which he replies that it's actually his fate to do it. Um, his, his, he can't escape 
the decrees of providence that say that this is what he has to do. And in fact, the, uh, the change the, uh, that, uh, that this kind of savage conquest brings about in people's lives is essential to, um, to the continuance of, of life. Uh, <clears throat> well, this is just a story, though it was told a good many times in antiquity and uh, rewritten in a number of Greek and Latin texts up to the end of, uh, end of uh, um, the sixth century. Um, it's a kind of allegro and penseroso moment when, these, uh, when, these, um, when the conqueror is brought face to face with the quietest philosopher who does nothing but sit under a tree and uh, waits for the fruit to fall down so that he can eat it. And that's, uh, that's what they live on. Um, and these people existed. They're also described in the historians. Um, Alexander was rather impressed by them. And some, some of them were impressed by him. The leader, as, they, as he's called, Dandamis, was not. Uh, Alexander gave him some gifts, gold and bread and oil, um, which Dandamis uh, received with contempt, except he said, well, I'll have the oil. It'll help the fire burn a bit more brightly. Uh, <clears throat> um, but Alexander adopted one of these naked philosophers, a character called Kalanus, who then traveled with Alexander um, for the rest of the expedition and until uh, uh, Kalanus fell ill and took his own life by ascending a pyre in Parsagadai, probably in Parsagadai rather than Persepolis. There are the naked philosophers. They've popped up at just the right moment. Um, now, Kalanus traveled with Alexander, um, as I say, to the end of his life including the journey down the River Indus after Alexander turned back, decided not to continue with the conquest of India. And that journey down the Indus occupied six months. Uh, there was a certain amount of slaughtering involved as they went along, but I can't imagine other than that Alexander and Kalanus and a couple of other Greek philosophers who traveled with Alexander, namely Anaxarchus and Pyrrho, sat together on the poop deck of an evening, and uh, they, the, the Greeks learned a bit of Sanskrit, and the Indian learned a bit of Greek, and the Indian taught them a bit about uh, Indian philosophy. Pyrrho was very impressed. Pyrrho seems to have adopted certain Buddhist ways, and uh, is known as the founder of radical skepticism, which has a great many affinities, which I could uh, go into in more detail if you were really interested, um, with, uh, with the Buddhist, Buddhist idea of no self and the impermanence of, of everything. So, uh, to wrap up, Alexander's travels really created the conditions for this kind of intellectual interchange and reflection on the big questions of life. How to live, how to die, and, he, uh, and such figures as Anaxarchus and Pyrrho raised interesting and intricate philosophical questions which fed into the intellectual ferment of the period following Alexander's death, which I think of as the 40 Years War, because the successors were at war for 40 years until uh, the uh, Hellenistic kingdoms finally took some sort of uh, coherent form. Um, and like many other periods of political and military chaos, it was also a period of great intellectual activity the, the uh, Hellenistic Alexandrian scholars um, were, um, were the source of uh, enormous amount of intellectual in, uh, advances, not just philosophy, but science and other things as well. And it's because Alexander brought these different worlds together, or I would say, um, one 
that at least one aspect of that was this interchange between India and, uh, and Greece. And if, I, if I'm spared, that's what I'm going to be spending the next uh, decade or so thinking about. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank, thank you both very much. Uh, so what we're going to do is we'll have a chat for maybe 15 minutes, uh, 20 minutes uh, between ourselves, um, and then we will be taking your questions. Um, just, just to kick off, uh, Richard, um, you portray a figure who in a way is infinitely capable of attracting legends. He's kind of like a, a magnet attracting iron filings. He just kind of picks them up. Um, and Lindsay, you talked about how um, the historical Alexander, if we can talk of such a thing, how, how perspectives on him are constantly changing. So back in the 30s and the 40s, um, an age when uh, British imperialism was viewed in a much more positive light than it is now, there was this idea that Alexander had done all his, his conquering and his slaughtering in the name of a brotherhood of man that he was interested in establishing a kind of United Nations. Um, this is obviously an idea that um, over recent decades has, uh, has faded from uh, academic discourse. And you talked about how you in your, you know, your own career, you have seen how um, the allure of Alexander as a conqueror has begun to fade among your students for, I guess, for obvious reasons, reflecting the kind of the, the evolving ethos. But what struck me going into the exhibition was that the historical Alexander seems almost as flexible, almost as ready to kind of um, attract positive takes as the mythical Alexander, because in, in the exhibition, um, Alexander is portrayed as a gay icon. So his, his best friend, um, the Patroclus to his Achilles, Hephaestion, has been cast regularly as, as, as uh, a participant in a gay relationship with Alexander. And also, um, very, very kind of fashionably in the exhibition, we have the figure of Bagoas, the, the Persian boy, uh, written about by Mary Reynolds. Um, <coughs> a, a, any, any young boy who reads that is almost calculated to cross his legs when he reads the scene where <laughs> Bagoas actually becomes a eunuch. Um, but in that, there is a, we see Alexander portrayed as a kind of uh, transgender hero. Do you think that um, there is enough in the historical story of Alexander that he can always kind of pick up positive spins? So the imperialist Alexander comes to be seen as, as something negative, but the LGBT Alexander kind of starts to hove into view. Do you th think that would be a fair perspective? I, I, I personally, yes. I think it... I guess possibly some of my arguments revealed that I think to a certain extent there's, there's a bit of a void there that is filled with creative story making yeah. out of people's expectations. Um, and I think if you have, he's more of an event than a person <laughs> in, quite a lot of our, in quite a lot of our material. So if you have an event, you can kind of project all sorts of different expectations and takes upon him. Um, I don't have a particular need to sort of see it as, as positive or or negative, um, but it is interesting to see how uh, there have been different responses to elements of the story over the years. I've, I've, I remember getting into a small argument with a student over the marriages of the Persian women to, um, to Alexander's Macedonians, um, which, you know, is, is kind of like a potentially a war crime. <laughs> <laughs> um, but is kind of often romanticized and seen as something quite wholesome and in support of the sort of League of Nations idea. Um, so you can take things both ways depending on your perspective. Um, and really, one of the things that it's worth emphasizing about our approaches to Alexander is to be critical and multi-skilled, I would yeah. say. As Richard was saying, you need yeah. to cover several traditions at once. Only one of those marriages lasted, didn't it? Seleucus's marriage. That we heard of. All, all the rest uh, <laughs> fell apart fairly quickly. But uh, one of the interesting things about the Alexander romance is that the, there's no sex in it, actually, of any kind. I mean, he, get, he gets married to Roxana, who is presented as the, uh, 
as the daughter of Darius, which uh, in history she wasn't, but, uh, but there is, it, there's no kind of romantic aspect to it. And the nearest you get to this is, a, is the story of his visit to the, uh, um, the Queen of Meroe, Queen Candace, or Candace. Um, but she's actually a mother figure rather than a, rather than a, um, any kind of girlfriend. Though in some of the later Byzantine rewritings of the, of the story, that does, become, that does become a romantic encounter. And is that because you, you touched on how, um, well, Liz, you touched on, on how he's portrayed by Josephus going to the temple. Then you talked about uh, how the Christian scholars write about him and how mm. he ends up remarkably as a figure in the Quran. Mm. Do you, do you think that the reason that in the, in the Alexander romance, despite the fact that it's named a romance, <laughs> there isn't actually much um, romance as we would describe it, is be because in these stories he comes to be focused on much more kind of abstract uh, objects of desire, whether that is the Jewish, the Christian, or the Muslim God, or his his, his pothos, his yearning for, for the unknown and the unreachable. Yeah. Do you think that that's, that's what's kind of motivating him? Yes. Um, well, the pothos is a word that uh, Arian uh, gives us many times, pothos, meaning desire or longing. Um, and whenever Alexander decides to do something yet more outlandish or to go even further, it's his pothos at work. He just can't, uh, can't control himself. And in the romance, this is carried to the ultimate degree because uh, he is constantly searching for immortality. He is frustrated in his search for the water of life. He is frustrated in it because his cook gets there first um, and he fails to drink it. Um, and it, towards the end of the romance, there's the wonderful encounter with the talking trees in India. Well, you'll meet the trees when you go into the exhibition. They'll tell your fortune for you, which is rather special. Um, but they'll probably tell your fortune the same as mine, actually. You're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, and, then, and in the end, that's what, they, that's what they tell him. Yes, you're going to die. But I mean, what they say is, um, you'll never go home again, you're going to die in Babylon very soon, and your wife and sister are going to be horribly murdered. Uh, just just oh. what you wanted to hear from, <laughs> yeah. from a, a, a friendly tree. <laughs> well, so, so the, the idea of a hero who roams the world uh, looking for um, an escape from death, there are echoes there of much older epic traditions yeah. that are associated with Mesopotamia. So Gilgamesh is the, the classic yes. example. Yes. Now, Lindsay, as I understand it, one of, the, one of the kind of academic developments over the recent decades has been a, an appreciation of the degree to which um, Babylonian culture endured well into the Hellenistic period. So, to what extent do both of you think that the stories that come to be told of Alexander may bear the trace elements of Mesopotamian legend? Yeah, I had a wonderful student who wrote a thesis on the parallels between Alexander and Gilgamesh and other aspects of Mesopotamian epic, um, and I hope some of that sees the light of day um, mm. soon. Um, so I think there is tons of work to be done on that. Um, it's so interesting that looking at it from the perspective of somebody who looked at a kind of the, a long durée, a long perspective view of conquest ideology, um, including near Assyrian, near Babylonian and Persian kings when I was a student, um, the pothos idea tends to pop up when Alexander does something that you'd expect an Assyrian king to do. You know, the sort of, oh, let's climb a mountain. Oh. Yeah. Uh, let's do something really performatively propagandistic. <coughs> uh, let's cross this desert. It's the pothos. Mm. And that kind of yearning is something that, that seems to appear in, in earlier conquest accounts too. So in that sense, Alexander is following other people's footsteps. I think it's quite an exciting range um, of ideas. And the other thing to note is that it's already a very diverse court that's part of the Achaemenid system. You have multiple religions, multiple communities, multiple ethnicities who are all exchanging ideas, philosophical ideas. They're often all arguing with each other, one presumes, in order to gain favor with the king. <laughs> um, and so one already has a sort of um, potential for the exchange of ideas at that point that Alexander sort of comes in and perhaps ramps up mm. um, too. So, but that's his speculation. I, I um, 
did some investigation a few years back into the, I, into the concept of Alexander's Fortuna, his fortune in Quintus Curtius, um, because the Fortuna of Alexander, which is almost always on his side and is helping him to uh, achieve his ends, is very different from uh, Fortuna, fate, touche in Greek, in most other Greek and Roman authors, when, because for, Fortuna in Seneca, for example, is your enemy. Um, you, you never know what she's going to do to you next, whereas on, in, Alex, in Quintus Curtius, she's always on Alexander's side. And I think that Quintus Curtius would, has picked up a little bit of a Persian idea about the far of the king, mm -hmm. um, uh, which uh, influenced his idea of Fortuna. I even thought I could trace it, trace who, uh, who Quintus is, who Curtius is, uh, sources had been talking to, but it's all a bit speculative, but uh, it's another, uh, I think it's another possibility. And if I might mention one more thing, um, the, the image of Alexander ascending into the sky, born, by, uh, born in a, um, a chariot or a box or something carried by griffins, very often this is represented in cathedral art and elsewhere as Alexander sitting like this, and on either side of him there is, there is a, gr a griffin face, facing inwards. And, and this is a Persian image. This is the master of the animals, isn't it? Um, and it also appears on uh, some of the furniture from the so-called Tomb of Philip at Vergina, uh, which suggests to me that all this furniture is uh, actually post-Alexander's uh, mm. conquest of Persia, because that was where they got the imagery from. So, so that's, to my mind, another uh, Persian and, in, and uh, also Mesopotamian image. So, so if we can recognize the imprint of Mesopotamian and Persian <coughs> myth-making on the figure of Alexander, both in, in the historical sources and in the more legendary sources, what about the, the process of Alexander's own self-mythologization? So we, we are told that he, 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 he travels with historians, and the Roman historians claim to be drawing on these historians. Now, you don't go off with a load of historians unless you think you're going to be a historical figure, a figure mm. of, of, of earth-shaking moment. But we're also told that he, he traveled with uh, you know, the Iliad under his pillow, wherever he went. Um, and I wonder, to what extent do you think both the historical and the legendary understanding of Alexander that we have is shaped by Alexander's own attempt to shape his legend? Um, I think it might be shaped by Ptolemy's attempt <laughs> to shape Alexander's legend. I think they, we didn't, we, we perhaps unjustly not mentioned Ptolemy very much in this. But if we think so about... Ptolemy is his friend who takes his body Yeah, who hijack, hijacks the body and basically... Becomes turn, pharaoh in Egypt. ...turns Alexandria into um, a kind of manifestation of the memory of Alexander, all the way down to this, all of these multiplying stories about its foundation by Alexander. And, you know, he's, he's physically in the city. And Arian thought that Ptolemy was bound to be the most reliable source for Alexander because Ptolemy was a king, and it would be disgraceful for a king to tell a lie. Therefore, everything in his history must That's be That's why Oliver Stone, in his film, begins with Anthony Hopkins yeah. as yes. Ptolemy. Yeah. 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 But yeah. It's, a, it's a really good frame in the film because, in a sense, it shows how much the story is probably Ptolemy's. So I showed um, the mosaic, Alexander mosaic at the end with a view of Darius as, as mm. king fleeing. Um, and, and that is one of the locations proposed for an original version of that is Alexandria. Um, that so much of the sort of narrative and the kind of, especially um, the aspects, I didn't, Richard may disagree, but a lot of the aspects relating to India are partly related to Ptolemaic imperialism and um, their own posturing yeah. in the Hellenistic world. So um, it's one thing, it, it, Richard's, sort of other point about the iconography being interpreted as a tale is quite telling in our in the in example I mm. showed that you have an awful lot of what appear to be quite immediate um, and personal stories about Alexander that are actually far more commentaries on 
on, on, her, on his reception in the but, but, 300 but years afterwards. Do you so so this is not my good, uh, good do, answer do, to your question. Do you question. think that we can say anything about the historical Alexander's relationship to Homer and... No. No, nothing at all. <laughs> that is, that is you can argue for it. I'm not ruling it out. But, uh, but, it's, but, but th this idea that he is inspired by Homer, that he models himself on Achilles, this is, this is a myth that we, we cannot redeem and, and reconstitute as, uh, as history. I think it's very difficult to do so. I'm going okay, to be well very that's cautious and skeptical. annoyingly. He, yes. goes, he, he goes beyond that, doesn't he? I mean, yes, Troy is important. When he when he's crossed the Hellespont, he has to go to go to Troy and have a look at the uh, the tomb of Achilles and so on. But he goes so far beyond that. Uh, I, I think that what he's actually um, in terms of Greek mythology and religion, it's Heracles and Dionysus. He's, yeah, uh, Dionysus he's hunting comes for with all, elephants all to Greece, the doesn't he? And that's so. right. That's right. Yes, yeah. the Dionysus myth has to has to be in there, and he has to find Dionysus um, in all sorts of places where um, uh, where um, where some, uh, where where ivy is growing, for example, because uh, yeah. because it's Dionysus's plant and the. Uh, um, the story about the conquering the rock of Aeornus. I mean, it's said that he did that because Heracles had already done it. Yeah. But it's made quite clear by Arian that actually he made up this story. Yeah. Um, he made up the story that Heracles had done it in order to uh, make it something more important uh, in his career. But also this kind of sense, it's like Everest. You, you climb it because it's there. You, it, this huge That's rock, right, yes. Know, people well, say it can't be conquered, so yeah. I'm going to conquer well, it. A bit like going across the desert. It's, yes, yeah. yes. Well, it was, yeah. a, it was a, a difficult rock to conquer, I guess. <laughs> yeah. but, um, <laughs> okay, it, mm. so um, just one last uh, question before we open it up to, to you guys. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen the exhibition. It, I mean, there is a, an amazing array of material from across <coughs> the world, from across a whole array of different periods. One of the things that really struck me, though, was the... Um, the ability of Alexander to generate myth right the way into the present. So I think absolutely one of my favorite and most unexpected things in there is where um, Alexander the Great comes back from the dead and he captures um, world leaders, including Mrs. Thatcher, <laughs> and is confronted by Superman, which is certainly not in the Alexander romance or indeed in uh, Arian. Um, and so I just, I just wondered what, what it, for both of you, is your favourite modern retelling of, of Alexander, of the Alexander story? Ooh, uh, wow. Because I grew up a pony girl, um, <laughs> there's a, a beginning of a movie called The Black Stallion, um, where the tale of Bucephalus and Alexander is told as though it is a separate fable that has nothing to do with anything else. And I love that story because it's connected with introducing an object into the story, and it's all about the idea that you know, that it, it's the one point where it actually does seem like quite a wonderful and romantic story. And so I, I, I really love, love that, that rendition. I think I needed notice of that question. Oh, I <laughs> so, you don't have to answer. I, had so I have so many uh, favourite <laughs> modern treatments, but... Uh, I mean, you I, can have three, your top I'm, three. I'm always very... Uh, I am a great admirer of Mary Reynolds because I think she imagines the ancient world very effectively and largely convincingly. And, and she also went very seriously into the nature of Alexander in the book of that title. And uh, really, uh, <clears throat> um, I think, managed to say a lot that was, uh, that was very, uh, very telling about, about him. Um, otherwise, it's the, uh, um, it's the, you know, the standard modern modern historians, I suppose, that I find myself working with most of the time. I, I completely agree with you about, mm. uh, about Mary Reynolds. Mm. Um, Fire from Heaven and The Persian yeah. Boy and um, amazing novels. Yes. Okay, um, do you have any questions, dear audience? Surely there must be... Yes. Yes. Two at the back, one there, one there. Thank you, very, thank you very much. Uh, it was a fascinating subject and it's a, a fascinating talk. So as, as you mentioned, Ptolemy half hinged the corpse and took it off to Alexandria, where it became um, a massive tourist attraction throughout most of 
at late antiquity, but then mysteriously disappeared. So if you were Indiana Jones, where would you go to try and find the corpse? Um, under the water. <laughs> well, I, I've just been there uh, I, a couple of weeks ago to Venice. Uh -huh. <laughs> brilliant, the brilliant thesis that uh, Venetian sailors sailed to Alexandria uh, looking for the body of St. Mark. Um, you know, evangelist, brilliant. Get him, bring him back, make him the patron of Venice. So they stop at Venice uh, and they look around for a body and there's an amazing body in an amazing sarcophagus. Must be St. Mark. So they nick it, wrap it up in pork so that the Muslim customs inspectors won't, uh, won't look too closely, <laughs> bring it back to Venice, um, bury it under the main altar of uh, San Marco. Um, and so I, I, I went there a couple of weeks ago and paid my respects to the body of Alexander the Great. <laughs> I mean, it's a great, I, great thesis. Um, who knows? Um, Lindsay, do you have... It's never going to be excavated, is it? No, I think it's improbable. <laughs> DNA tests, I think, <laughs> unlikely. I love the St. Mark's idea. Um, I've been there to look at the Achaemenid vase that's in the treasury, <laughs> uh. which is also an interesting presence. I don't know why it's there. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's worth noting that it, it was a revered shrine through the Islamic period as well. Um, so if you, if you wanted to go and check out um, a really magnificent work by P.M. Fraser called Ptolemaic Alexandria, um, he has all the footnotes on all the tales about the um, traces of the shrine, um, uh, which he proposes is connected to the memory of Alexander. Um, and the other thing that is a tale circulating, which is alluded to in the exhibition, is the idea that the Nectanebo um, uh, sarcophagus, which is reproduced in the exhibition downstairs um, and can be viewed in the British Museum, was reputedly also a burial place or used as a burial place for Alexander, which is a, an idea that has been revived more recently. It's like, why not? Uh, but if it is the sarcophagus of Nectanebo, then I'm afraid it's empty and in the British Museum, which is on brand. But maybe he's still out there, who knows? Um, there was a, a question at the back there, I think. Yes, but, and then behind, right, in, right at the back after that. Uh, hello. Um, I met Ale Alexander from teaching uh, the new GCSE on um, ancient history. Um, and I teach it to Year 10s uh, in Tower Hamlets, East London. Um, and I teach all these kids all the way to Year 10. And at no point have they ever been taught about uh, a bisexual person. Um, and you seem to not be sure whether he is or whether he isn't, but we teach it very much as if he is, he is bisexual. And the first couple of lessons, the kids are a bit uneasy about it. And then by sort of the second week, it's just taken for granted that he is. Um, so I think it's really important that the kids get to learn about bisexual person history. Um, they don't get any other chance to do it before or after. Um, I wonder how important you think that is to his legend. Lindsay? Um. I think it, I mean, I think it, it has become extremely important now, and I, I think, as you point out, exactly what you say, um, it, it's a possibility that's, um, that deserves a lot of examination, a lot of kind of interest. Um, I think it's definitely one of the most interesting aspects for students to talk about. I'm possibly disappointing them a bit. Maybe <laughs> I'm a bit like Tarn, who was like, I don't want to talk about that <laughs> in the 1940s. Um, the, be a bit too British, but Richard, what yeah. do you think? On the, on the other hand, um, it's not a the homosexuality, bisexuality are not car categories in the ancient world. There is no word for these thing, for these dispositions in Greek or Latin. Um, the, 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 there simply is no uh, particular differentiation made. Um, people can may freely have sex with either sex, and given the availability of slaves of either sex, it was probably very easy for them you know. to, to do that in many cases. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if Alexander would have understood if you called him bisexual. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess it's what I was touching on, the way in which Alexander is such a hero, he's such a totemic figure that, that even as the kind of idea of him as a great world conqueror becomes unfashionable, 
something else comes in to replace it. Mm. And now he's a kind of great gay icon because mm. that's, you know, he, the fact that he is a hero seems to remain constant. Why he's a hero, on what basis he is to be lauded as a hero, that changes. But, um, I, I mean, it's, it, it, it's fascinating that, that your students still accept that he's a hero. <laughs> Thank you, it was very interesting. Um, I saw an exhibition at the British Museum, which rather surprised me. It was about ancient Greece, and it said categorically that ancient Greek men only had relationships with women in order to have children and families and that their friendships and romances and everything were with other men. I was surprised. I'm not surprised you were surprised. <laughs> I think that's a rather <laughs> over cut and dried statement. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, how do we know? Yes. We don't, we don't have uh, any, any utterances about this, really, and we certainly don't have anything that the women said about it. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. Do you think that um, if Alexander hadn't died so young, he would have been able to sustain his empire that had become so large and going out so far? Or do you think that it's kind of fortunate for his legend that he died at such a young age before he had a chance to all fall apart? Live fast, die young. That's a great question. Yeah. Lindsay, what do you think? Um, I think it's been a, it's a great advantage to the, the legend <coughs> that he did die this young because everybody had to leap on him as a kind of totem of, of whatever was coming out of this disruption to um, the existing political order. So you have lots and lots of people doing lots of different versions of that. So, of course, it becomes this immensely fertile starting point. I don't know whether he would have sustained it. Um, he did put, it, put to death, death a lot of people on the way back into Iran and Mesopotamia. Um, I, I, would have, I think there's probably, there probably would have been quite a bit more violence, but there were certainly attempts to kind of keep, um, manage the legacy of this political class that was still there. They hadn't all been wiped out from the previous um, empire. Um, so I, I don't know it would have been a successful attempt to hold on to power. There might have been a similar kind of fragmentation that did happen into different, um, uh, into different sort of areas of control by his lieutenants, if you, if you see what I mean, simply because the same kind of um, communication system would have been in operation but would have been perhaps a bit, bit more difficult to operate if you were removing key people at lots and lots of different places that had been there in familial kind of locations for several generations. So there would have been some kind of massive disruption anyway. That's my main answer, I would have said. There were supposed to have been his last plans. He it was said at his death to be, to be planning further conquests uh, in North Africa, Carthage, and further west to uh, create a world empire but uh, he wasn't in, in, in the final stages doing terribly well at holding together what he'd got already. Um, he, the Indian, um, the Indian uh, conquests, the Indian kingdoms that he made his own reverted almost as soon as he'd turned his back. Uh, and this is, I think, one of the reasons why there isn't really very much legend about Alexander in ancient Indian sources. He just wasn't very interesting for them. It was a little local, local turmoil for a short period. Um, also, I wonder, really, I mean, so often you feel that Alexander is doing kind of tourism with an army. Um, yeah. He's actually really interested in seeing places and meeting philosophers and all these other kind of things. And perhaps the, uh, the hard work of administration was uh, not something that he most wanted to, uh, to commit himself to. Uh, his attempts to yeah. create a mixed <laughs> ruling class uh, don't seem to have got very far. Made it India, all I got was his elephant. 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, so, so just to say, the last plans yes, please. do sound suspiciously Roman, don't they? Yeah, I mean, cause, because on, yes. the, on, on the Roman, on, on, the, on this idea that Alexander was planning to um, conquer the West, the Romans were obsessed by this idea. Uh, and mm. it inspires Livy, the great <laughs> historian of Rome, to come up with, um, I think after Herodotus, the second counterfactual in, in history, where he asks what would have happened had Alexander lived and had he invaded Italy and confronted the infant Roman Republic. Um, and Livy has no doubt that, <laughs> of course, the Romans, of course the Romans, Romans, Romans would have won. Would have won. <laughs> but, but I think that for the Romans, Alexander's youth is a, a crucial part of his image because he serves as a kind of warning, particularly in the Republican period, of just how dangerous it can be for young men to have control of an army. Which is why if you look at the portrait busts of Romans from the Republican period, they kind of fetishize <coughs> age. I mean, they all have you know, crow's feet and baggy lines under their <laughs> eyes and all kinds of stuff. Which is why, again, in the imperial age, when um, Augustus, who, who goes to visit the body of Alexander, and I think knocks the tip of his nose off, um, when he is portrayed throughout his life as a young person, you know, he's laying claim to that, in a way, that kind of, that, that image of Alexandrian youth. Mm. Um, and it's a real marker of the, the, the end of the Republican period and the beginning of the, the autocracy of the, uh, the imperial age. Anyway, do we have, um, there's a gentleman in the front. Thank you for a, a fascinating evening. We in our time have become much more aware of China than we used to be. Um, is there anything in the mythology of um, Alexander which reveals um, how, in his time, China was viewed? Is there, is there any... I think one of you referred to their, him, him even getting close to China or something like that. Can you fill us in on that? Yes. Um, the, uh, the Syriac version of the Alexander Romance, which was written in about the 5th or 6th century AD, is a translation of the, from the Greek, but it has um, additional material. And uh, one of the bits of additional material is that he uh, encounters the emperor of China. Um, so uh, by this, this is about the time when the Western world is beginning to understand that that there is a China and a little bit about what it's like. Um, and that gets expanded, I think, quite a bit in the Persian epics, doesn't it? Um, there's a, doesn't, doesn't Alexander actually have a Chinese girlfriend in the... Yeah, the, 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 the scope of his sphere of operations mm. expands to kind of include the perspective from Iran, I would say, or from, and further, further east. Um, so yeah, China yes. does become a full participant as a sort of yes, scene. Um, I mean not in not in his <coughs> lifetime, because essentially the, the Greek understanding is that India is the furthest east you can go. That there's nothing really beyond that. Um, not as far as we know from from the sources on him for mm. yeah They're for his lifetime. Mm. Although I mean we would imagine that there are actually across Central Asia um, sort of routes that do connect. The, I mean, there there are the, there, there's the theory, isn't there, that the terracotta army, uh, which stands in the tomb of mm. the first mm. emperor um, in China, that, that these are influenced perhaps by Greek models of sculpture. Yeah, I don't I know whether you have any views on the plausibility yeah, of that I think thesis. That's pretty, uh, well, it's possible, but I think it's a bit far-fetched. Um, I mean, going back the, in the Greek period, yes, the there is an awareness of some people called the Ceres, the silk people. Um, and Nearchus, the Alexander historian, writes about Serike, which means silk. But he, the word for the Ceres never actually turns up. And then suddenly, in, about China. In, in, August, yeah. in Augustan poetry, suddenly the Ceres keep on turning up. It's, um, it's, an, it's an awareness that comes yeah. in at the beginning of the Roman Empire. But it's, but, it, but it's confusing, isn't it? Because Pliny describes <coughs> them as having red hair and blue eyes, which doesn't sound... Not very Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> no, though Potentially <laughs> quite Central Asian, though. Uh, Central Asian yeah. is possible, yes. Mm. Anyway, um, do we have... Um, <coughs> Excuse me. I was wondering if we have much in relation to Alexander's relationship with Aristotle, um, either in 
historical record evidence or in myths that might have developed subsequently. Um, Lindsay, what's the... <laughs> Lucky you. Um, I, so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my annoying teacher thing, which is I would suggest that we, we, we treat Alexander's relationships with contemporaries, famous contemporaries, with, with slight caution. Um, so, the idea that a, um, a king has his designated sage is something that appears in Mesopotamian culture as well and later eras. So um, it could be that, and if you look at Pliny and look at all the particular artists that are associated with Alexander, it's all the most famous ones. <laughs> um, so bear in mind that there could be a little bit of like, well, he's famous, he's famous, um, that going on. But um, I did want to sort of m point out that a lot of the kind of wisdom literature, medieval wisdom literature um, tradition associated with Alexander is fundamentally built, built around this relationship with Aristotle. So it becomes an incredibly important axis, an incredibly important um, uh, point of thinking about the advice one gives to kings, which is another major medium that Alexander inhabited, role that Alexander inhabited. Um, but Ri Richard might have other ideas about yeah. Aristotle's historical relationship with Alexander, which is a bit more generous than mine. Well, there's not very much we can say about it, really, but uh, um, it, we, we do seem to be told that uh, Aristotle was employed by Philip as his tutor. Um, but uh, there's really very, very little detail about... Uh, and, and the legends that are told of Alexander, Aristotle is obviously a huge figure uh, both in, in Christian Europe and in, in the Muslim world. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the legends, he's incredibly important. So, so yes. what, what, how, how is that relationship amplified in the legends? Um, well, as Lindsay said, through these uh, Mirrors of Princes texts, notably, for example, The Secret of Secrets, which is one of the first, Im first objects that you'll come to in the, in the exhibition, I think. There's an Arabic version and there's a... Um, an English translation of this, and it's one of the uh, one of the earliest uh, English book printed books. Um, and yes, Aristotle is there to convey all kinds of precepts about how to be a good king and how well how to be a good person, actually, but specifically focused on kingship. And this secret of secrets, which starts off in Arabic, uh, I think I'm right in saying, uh, then goes like the romance into in a great many languages of, uh, of Western Europe and Spanish because of the Arab presence in Spain and from, from there on into uh, Latin, English uh, and so on. So, uh, so it, it's, re it's really a medieval story, the, uh, this uh, this interaction in, of Alexander and Aristotle. In, in the Roman period, there are a lot of Greek philosophers who are pitching themselves to Roman emperors as an Aristotle <coughs> equivalent. Yeah. And the way that they kind of invariably suck up to Caesar mm. is to say, well, Alexander was awful, of course. He, you know, <laughs> he, he just went off on one and, and didn't mm. pay attention to a philosopher at all. But you, Caesar, will be different. Is that a tradition that passes into the medieval period? The idea that... Um, Alexander actually ignored Aristotle and kind of went off the rails. <laughs> um, it, it, it's, not in the, it's not in this wisdom tradition, no. I, I, don't, I don't think you do get that. Um, it's, uh, I, I think also uh, throughout the Hellenistic period, it was important for, uh, for kings to have philosophers at, at court. I mean, their, their friends had to include... Uh, philosophers as well as uh, other cultural uh, individuals. Um, so there's a, there's a long tradition lying behind uh, uh, Seneca trying to uh, trying vainly yes, to that have, works have out an well, impact on Nero. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it's a model um, that is also proposed for the earlier kings. So you, for Xerxes being one example, Richard can speak to as well, that you, you also have Xerxes being advised by you know, advisors who, who he ignores. Uh, but he's notably portrayed as being a less successful advisee than Alexander. In that, in that, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
very fascinating. I was wondering, um, and maybe you alluded to this in, in a way, uh, the myth of Alexander, is this actually the, the, uh, the legacy um, or the, the legacy of Alexander, the, um, the power or the, the creation of the, the, the drive to create the Roman Empire, so that uh, this uh, myth actually um, motivated Romans to achieve similar things and, and, and eventually go beyond the, the limits of what they might have in mind uh, during the Republic. Mm. Well, I mean, the other important thing to note is that it, 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 the, the birth of these Roman narratives really hits at the point where Octavian and August, uh, Octavian, who becomes Augustus, makes himself Augustus, um, really has, a, has a, an emergence into autocratic power, or, or what he attempts to make autocratic power. Um, and that is, of course, happens at the same time that he defeats or takes over the Ptolemaic kingdom. So there's an important way in which to, a bit like Alexander and Cyrus, for our Roman emperors to associate themselves with Alexander, it shows that they're kind of jumping back over and overcoming these dodgy Hellenistic kings um, and, and kind of are, are on the model of the founder of that world rather than their successors. So it's important to note that it's not just Rome being sort of let's conquer the world, but it's its particular political moment of the Principate coming into being and, and being kind of, first of all, being incorporated in long assemblages of, of, of history, like that of Diodorus Siclus, and then Alexander himself becoming a focus of this idea of what is, what is monarchy, this kind of conquering monarchy. Oh, well, here we are, you know, let's examine this example. So, so it's, a re it's quite a distinct early imperial um, but, phenomenon, I would suggest. But, but, but I think even, I mean, even into the early imperial period, there is a deep suspicion around Alexander on the part of moralists and on the part of biographers. And when they look back at the warlords who destroy the Republic, the sense that both Pompey and Julius Caesar were modeling themselves on Alexander is used to explain basically why these warlords end up tearing the Republic to pieces. So Pompey is supposed to have modeled his quiff on Alexander's and to have worn his cloak. And the idea that Caesar is directly modeling himself on Alexander is a, a theme that doesn't necessarily redound to Caesar's advantage. Um, it, 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 it is seen as something that has made him possibly monstrous. But I do, yeah, I mean, over the course of the, um, of the decades, the, the, the sense of Alexander as someone to emulate um, does start to become more acceptable, and, and the, the classic example of this is Trajan, who launches um, a seemingly successful invasion of Mesopotamia, waters his horses, the Persian Gulf, um, and then goes back to Babylon and offers sacrifices to, uh, to, to, to the shade of Alexander. And basically, Babylon, by the early second century AD, is chiefly famous for the Romans as the place where Alexander died, which is basically the measure of, of, of how the historical memories of, of Babylon are, are starting to, to fade and become myth. We've got time for one, one last question, I think. If it could be a, a, a brief question. Hello, thank, uh, thank you very much for this uh, talk. Um, I'd just like to, um, if you could just elaborate briefly more on uh, Alexander and kind of like the end of days, like um, with the uh, kingdoms of Gog and Magog. <laughs> right, okay, well that's, that's not a short question, but it's a brilliant question, it's so fascinating. <laughs> and uh, talking about the end of days, I think it's a perfect way to end this, this uh, session. So. Right, let me see if I can uh, summarise that. Um, the, the story of the, enclosure of, the uh, enclosure of the unclean nations of Gog and Magog starts in Syriac literature in, in the uh, 6th century, um, in the... Uh, um, in the prophecy of a character called Pseudo-Methodius, um, um, who, of course, is prophesying with hindsight and says that uh, um, in the last days, the, the unclean nations who have been closed, enclosed behind a wall by Alexander will break through and usher in the age of the Antichrist. Um, this was another extraordinarily popular uh, text, the Pseudo-Methodius. It began in Syriac, it was immediately translated into Greek and then into Latin, and there are a huge number of uh, Western European 
translations. And of course, if you've got a, a nice prophecy of uh, the end of days, you can bring it out at any suitable occasion, really, um, uh, with small adaptations. So the, uh, I mean, the people who uh, um, were going to um, cause all the, the trouble for the uh, for pseudomethodius were were the Arabs, but then, then you could make it the Huns, or you could make it the Russians, or you could make it uh, anybody who was bothering you at the time. That's what you do with prophetic literature, um, very much like the, um, the other legends. Lizzie, one last comment on oh my goodness. Alexander and the End of Days? Yes. Um, one, this is something that, you know, if you were Babylonian, there was already a, a tendency to characterize everybody coming from the north. Um, northeast is scary, scary. <laughs> uh, two, this is another brilliant example of stories of Alexander being generated where pla in places where he, has, he never went because the Gog Magog story became a very important narrative in the sort of narrative of him coming to the Caucasus and, and becoming a sort of a civilizing king of the nations in the Caucasus where he never, as far as we can tell, ever went near. Um, and thirdly, this is partly Richard's fault. I had a student who went on and learned Armenian <laughs> purely to do, to, purely to study the Alexander Romance. So go forth and learn languages to learn to examine other versions of the Alexander Romance. We really we need, need it. We really need people who can do the Armenian Alexander Romance. Well, there you go, guys. <laughs> you know what you've got to do. Um, many, many thanks for coming. Thanks to our two wonderful guests. Have a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you.